Hello. Welcome from the IBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group, our 34th consecutive study group, might I add, in May of 2022. Uh, we have a few things to tell you today. First of all, our mission is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the Tampa Bay IT community. That really is a misnomer. We actually engage people all over Northern Florida as well as all over the world. And we have quite a number of them that are planning on coming to participate in our meetings. But the people that participate in our meetings and truly participate make our meetings so much better than they would be otherwise. You can reach us in a variety of different ways. First of all, you have joined our study group every Tuesday from seven to eight Eastern. Uh, we have our meetup, we have Zoom. These, this is where our past recordings are. If you wanna screenshot this, go for it. IIBA site, website, meetup, Facebook, and two LinkedIn groups. Uh, if you wanna contact us, you can uh, go to our website here and we can, we'll have our information for you at that place. We have taken, we have gone through a lot of classes. This is classes two through 17. If you wanna to go to our past meetings, you can see the uh, study questions, the test questions that we went through in each of these. If you want to talk about the test itself, how to apply for the test, that is class eight. Uh, we are a volunteer supported organization. Cliff is our president. He's online with us. Lori is our vice president. Caitlin and Priscilla are members at large that lean in whenever we need assistance. <coughs> My name is Thea Raisins. I'm the vice president of career and professional development for the chapter. And Tiffany Gardner sometimes leans in to help us out. The guy, the man, the man himself, the, Bob Churchill, who makes our uh, class legit. He has passed his CBAP certification. He's also passed a whole bunch of other things because he is a guru in this. He has an awesome website that has a large number of great information. That's not just about business analysis. It's also about project management, mechanical engineering, uh, Six Sigma, Lean, all kinds of other things that is very beneficial. And, and it, it's an adventure land to wade through uh, he is also available to answer questions should you have questions, because he's a nice guy. Uh, we have had lots of class participants, and we, as I said, are on our 34th class. I will take the screenshot of our attendance at the end and fill this in. Uh, Tish recently requested me to send her a list of the classes that she had participated in. I've, I was able to do that with our logo in the top corner as well as the suggestion that if they have any questions, they can call me directly. Okay, so today in our class, we are going to go over estimation with Bob, item tracking with Bob, and metrics and key performance indicators or KPIs with me. Uh, if you're interested in presenting any of these subjects, we've got just a few <clears throat> that we haven't yet, haven't yet presented, uh, business capability analysis, business rules analysis, which is cool, I want you to know. Uh, glossary, I thought I'd already done glossary. Um, observation, you have. I did. Well, I need to put in the date. I'll figure that out. Also, um, decision analysis and modeling, neither of those have been done. I swear I thought you had done those, Bob. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Well, I don't want to do that. Let me just erase these real quick. For some reason, I thought you did them both in the same meeting and that they related to each other. Okay. Uh, other things that we need people to take on is uh, organizational. I did organizational modeling. Okay. Sorry. I lost my file. It, it, whenever I opened it, it was two weeks back. Uh, roles and permissions matrix. I did that one also. Uh, sequence diagrams. I think Carol did that. If y'all remember, let me know. Uh, SWOT analysis, strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Somebody did SWOT. Okay. And uh, vendor assessment. Did someone do vendor assessment? 
I did the SWOT in the vendor assessment. That's what I thought. Awesome. Thanks, Tish. Okay. So I will sign up for uh, the two decision ones for um, coming weeks. Okay. And hopefully other people will jump in for the rest. Awesome. Perfect. So let's see. <laughs> We just have a few more business capability analysis and business rules analysis. I had my name on it, but I don't have to be the one to do it. And guys, to go through it, all you have to do is I'm going to show you. I'm going to go through key performance indicators in a few minutes, but I'm going to let Bob take the first one so that he and I are alternating instead of it being, you know, a one man show most of the time. We'll we'll switch back and forth. Bob, I will let you have the screen. Okay, which one are we doing? Whichever you want. All right. They're so, all good. Uh, we will do item tracking. Um, can everyone see? I can see it. Um, let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, there we go. So item tracking is really about monitoring issues that arise in all kinds of other work items. Um, the, they can arise in any context, in any phase of an engagement, even uh, in its operation and maintenance phase after the initial delivery happens. So, um, Basically, issues can come from anywhere in many different contexts. They're known by different names, to-do lists, punch lists, and so on. Or somebody just got mad and had a question or they're worried. They come from anywhere. The way I normally think of um, doing work within my framework is you do things in a certain order based on the management context, which means there are six identifiable phases plus two more post delivery over the entire product life cycle. Um, and they can come from anywhere. So um, everyone that arises needs a bunch of elements. One will be some kind of identifier. Now, if we're just doing this ad hoc on paper, okay, maybe we don't. But almost all modern operations of any size and coordinating any reasonable number of people basically automate or have some kind of electronic or shared tool to do this. So you have a unique identifier which acts as a database key um, that allows you to find the thing and uniquely label it. A summary is basically some kind of description, usually includes text, but can include images, diagrams, and any other media that tells this story. A category can be another kind of search key that allows certain kinds of grouping. Um, the type it may or may not be similar to a category. Um, you can create those definitions in whatever way it makes sense. 
If nothing jumps out to you, don't use it. These things are not holy writ. They're <clears throat> just guidelines. So um, the day the thing arose or was identified or communicated is important. Um, the name and contact information of the people or people or person or people, there we go, English, great language, wish I could speak it, um, who saw the thing and read the issue and shared it. Um, you have to write that down or save it. So um, that person is probably going to be one of the main people concerned with seeing it resolved. Um, the impact is what happens if it's not resolved. Priority is how important in terms of time and um, dependent functionality. Resolution time is, now there's a couple ways you can look at this. One is uh, when it was done, and that's great historical information. So you can collect statistics. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But uh, mostly it's your target date. This has to be done by X time or the kimchi is going to hit the fan, right? There is an owner or a responsible party that tries to get the thing done. There's a, well, an owner and also a resolver. So one person's responsible, another may actually do the work. A strategy is basically an approach for solving the problem. What the bad bug describes is a bunch of approaches that are very much like those listed in risk management. Um, so they don't have transfer as in insurance, but that would be a valid um, way to go. Um, there are other things to a more methodological product technical based approaches. So all those uh, will work. The status uh, may change over time. Um, one interesting thing about doing this work and revisioning these subjects and uh, thinking about it so I can um, share my thoughts with you is that I continually learn more. And uh, it occurred to me that the life cycle of items arising in different phases of an engagement will look uh, very different potentially. So I'll talk about that more in a little bit. And I have it on my list to do a more detailed write up on it that I'll share with you. Um, resolution update. So over time, um, you'll show the history of the work that's done. And uh, escalation matrix is basically uh, what happens and who should be contacted and who should intervene if the problem isn't solved in a reasonable amount of time. If you can think of other attributes, uh, go ahead and add them. It's all, again, these are guidelines, good places to start, rock on with your bad selves. So every um, organization and even every engagement within an organization may have its own uh, different projects and vocabulary for handling items that arise. Um, 
when I worked at Westinghouse Simulators, different projects had DRs, TRs, and PRs for deficiency reports, trouble reports, and problem reports. And it was usually the customer who asked for a particular language. And we were flexible. It didn't matter a report, a report. But that's just one of those things that come up. Um, as long as everyone agrees on the language and the approach, you're good. Um, again, like I said, there are um, different items may have different steps they'll pass through in a life cycle within each phase. So I link to um, a write-up I did a few years ago about how you can keep track of elements within um, my framework in Jira. And basically, they involve every little dot could have its own full life cycle. And um, when a test item, for example, comes to somebody in the testing organization or group, if they're separate, so you complete an implementation item and meets its definition of done, it gets forward to test. And then, um, so the life cycle might be something like, okay, it's been received in test, it's assigned to um, a number of different kinds of tests as appropriate. It's just um, assigned to individual testers. It either passes or fails the test, and it's routed um, to some other person, either back to implementation if it fails, or to logging, or to acceptance, or some status. Um, if you think about the life cycle of items in the conceptual model phase, they're different, right? Because you're identifying all these elements, all those individual dots in that phase. So the life cycle there might be, okay, I went to do a discovery interview with person A, and then I documented everything and they reviewed it and they sent it back for corrections. And then I made the updates and they accepted it. And that's the life cycle just within that phase. And one, um, one, to do item maybe one interview with one SME with the customer, but um, you might generate 50 discovery items that are all part of the conceptual model. So again, I'll write all this up. I think it's a really neat insight. Um, thank you for being here to inspire me to discover this. So um, statistics can be compiled on all this stuff, but you should be aware that these statistics are meaningful and fair. It isn't necessarily a good idea to say, hey, this one monster issue we resolved that took a month and 50 people um, is the same as three little one-line code fixes. Um, so you have to be aware of the relative weightings of things. And I think I've belabored the last point. 
a bunch by now. So basically, uh, whatever approach you want to take, you want to think about it, be aware of all the issues, or with your team to set up uh, some kind of system um, that makes sense for what you're doing. Um, and if you um, have seen different systems for tracking items or different ways of dealing with them or different vocabulary, I'd love to hear from you about it. Any Great. questions? Any questions? We've got 14 people. I bet you somebody's got a question or a story of how they've used this. There were some in questions in the chat, but I had a question about. Go ahead, Sylvia. When I looked at the process too, in some of the, sometimes you need a pretest or a baseline data. Like I didn't see that in there where you could put that. I can't pull it up on your, on your picture. You can picture. go ahead, Bob. Oh, what's the question? What was the context? <laughs> Well, because if you, if at the end, when you go through the project and stuff and they want to see um, how it's helped or how much it's helped or if it even helped, the only way to do that is to collect baseline data or do a pretest, depending what kind of thing it is. How do you incorporate that into that diagram that you have well, um, right now? So there are numerous different kinds of tools that would apply across a contract or uh, an engagement. And so if you're going to be able to show benefit at the end, you kind of have to be aware at the beginning of the project, what the cost benefit calculus is, you need to, um, really measure what's going on ahead of time and then compare it to the performance at the end. That, that is really a different concern from this. Okay, I was confused. <laughs> so that's the problem with a lot of things. Item tracking is really to do items. Now, if you want to make um, the overall cost benefit analysis or proof of improvement, its own item building in right from the get go and then track it as its own item. It may be in different phases. It may be across the whole project or the whole engagement. Um, and it may have its own unique life cycle. And what I'm trying to tell you in all these situations is give you a, not an X, Y, Z list of things to do, but a way of thinking about things that gives you guidance for how to do it on your own. Thanks. Item tracking has been critical in several of my projects. And my favorite way to do it is use an Excel spreadsheet and create about three columns of high level categories and then subcategories and subcategories. And then what is the question? What is the answer? Uh, who, provi who created the question? When they created the question? Who provided the answer? When they provided the answer? And if there's next steps or any links that, you know, a, a diagram or something that would explain it. Uh, the next steps is really important because I always add the date that the next step is due by and who it's who is responsible for it, kind of like a racy chart. That way it's easy to go back whenever we have the next meeting and say, this thing is still open and here's the next step. What's the status on that, Bob? And, and get the update from Bob. Or whenever these things are closed, we identify them as being closed that allows us to not lose any information, to track all the decisions that are made on the project, no matter what it's about, and have a central place for everyone to go to. 
I will tell you, keeping these things updated is a booger bear. It is so hard because I'm not the only one in meetings. I'm not the only one that <coughs> these updates or has potential information to put in it. But usually I'm the only one managing the document. So I have to kind of memorize the document and keep getting input from other people and going and saying, hey, is there any update on this? And did you hear anything else? And what's the next, the new update on your work stream? So it's challenging, but it's fantastic when somebody asks you a question and you can say, yes, John told me that on Thursday that here it is and here's the link to his code. All right, um, to address the render's question, what kind of lean principles and methodologies can we apply as a BA? So let's think about what lean is. Um, so Six Sigma is doing more with the same or doing better with the same resources, limiting losses, um, reducing waste, reducing errors, and reducing variation. Right, and by contrast, Six Sigma, oh, I'm sorry, Lean is about doing um, more with less. So rearranging things or automating things or applying resources to accomplish more work with the same resources or the same more with uh, less resources or both. And so that's really different than this um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, if you kind of fully structure and automate this process, or at least have an organized understanding of how to think about it and communicate it, then that saves a whole bunch of time and effort for everyone doing extra communication to try to come to a mutually shared understanding. And in that regard, that's kind of lean because you're cutting down the amount of effort. So it's a little bleak, but that's the answer I'd give you. This isn't technically lean, but it kind of is, if you take a loose definition of it. Good question. Thank you, Bob. Just, uh, one more question, one more point I'd like to make here. Uh, this is Narendra again. Um, in, in my organization, we use something like a DAIR, which is a Decisions, Actions, Issues, and Risks Register. And in that, uh, the, Two important sections are risks and issues. Something very similar, uh, it's the serial number. Uh, it's like a spreadsheet that we maintain and it's on the shared drive for all team members to access. And we do update all the uh, risks in it, the uh, risk category, the risk level, high, medium, low, uh, severe, uh, and uh, who's, go who's responsible to address that risk, any status updates, timelines around it, those kind of things. And in our weekly meetings, uh, what I do is I am the owner of that document. So I just go ahead and share the document on calls or via screen, screen sharing and take updates from, uh, the, you know, from everyone who's responsible to handle those. Yeah, it's something similar to the item tracking. Um, yeah, it's a very handy document to do. So essentially we address all the risks. Uh, certain risks become an issue. So they actually, um, uh, you know, get, get to the next level as a as an issue after being a risk for some time. Yeah, so I thought I'll just share that with the team. No, oh, that's a really good insight, actually. Um, so a risk is a special kind of item that arises. And really, it's its own thing. It's a standard part of project management, but it's equally germane to a BA type work. There's a lot of overlap um, managing communications, managing timelines, and so on. 
there's a huge amount of overlap between the two disciplines. The way I think about it is the project is really about managing the engagement and um, business analysis is more about doing the work to come up with a solution, finding out the needs and fulfilling them and communicating with the customer. So um, in a sense, uh, the BA work will fit inside um, the a project management type wrapper, but um, it's not as clear and clean cut as that. Um, I've studied both for a decent amount of time. Um, there's a reason that there are two separate organizations and certifications and both uh, bleed over into the other. Actually, PMI has its own uh, business analysis sub-certification. So there's a lot of bleed over there. And uh, the more you know about all of these things, um, the better off you're going to be. So what you guys are doing, a lot of these approaches are fairly general. So you can use the same techniques here for all of those. Um, every um, customer or uh, person you have to communicate with can be an item with a life cycle. All the identified risks can be handled that way. It's all kind of modular and conceptual and abstract. And you can apply those ideas to a lot of different things. Very good. Anybody else have any questions or comments about Bob's topic? Hi, Thea. This is Bonnie Moorhead here. How's everyone this evening? Hi, Hi. Uh, I can just attest to what Bob is saying. I mean, I worked as a consultant for a few years and, um, you know, in one area um, I had worked with a, um, an infrastructure risk working group. And it was really kind of nice because with the item tracking, I was actually tasked with, you know, tracking the security risks for this group for the, you know, during these review meetings. And um, to your point, Thea, uh, you know, managing a spreadsheet in Excel, it became actually um, a reusable artifact that I was able to utilize uh, as a BA in, you know, multi on multiple projects and actually in multiple organizations. So uh, I, I, I found that baseline in a template, you know, to that, you know, documenting like having the certain columns like risk the risk issues the actions you know potential um implications you know the actions you know collecting the actions and things that are nature with the dates and things like that um i would totally agree with that and i just wanted to say that you're you're both so so very right and i i found that in organizations that i've worked in that did not have any governance really or um you know really any templates i found that i had to defer to those, you know, reusable templates. So you're, you're hundred percent correct. So, right. yeah. So I, I enjoyed this. This is great. I have to tell you, I learned something. I just, I came in late to the meetings, but I learned something new every time I attend. <laughs> so I thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, one final comment from me is that I talked about uh, as one of my webinars I did uh, last year, about the overlap between a bunch of different practice areas, Six Sigma, cybersecurity, business analysis, project management, and uh, their various certifications, data analysis also. Um, I think it was number 11 or 12 in my BA series. You can find it on, on my website as uh, either the slides or the actual presentation, if you're interested in digging into that. 
I have uh, maybe one other article I could write on in that would clarify it some more, but I hit most of the high points there. Oh, thank you for raising that point, Bob. I'm certainly going to go and look because I'm very much interested. Thank you so much. Yeah, run it at a fast speed. I sound almost like a normal human. <laughs> You're doing beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. To be fair, Bob, sometimes the things you say are so heavy that I need it slower. So we're good. We're, we're just fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you need it slow. I'm your guy. <laughs> okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, let me say one thing about uh, organizations that don't have governance. If you have an organization that you have reporting up or down, you know, managing up reporting or managing down reporting, uh, providing QA uh, testing, providing regulatory, providing legal uh, feedback, you need to have records. And if your records are not thorough, you're gonna get yourself in trouble, even if there's not official governance, if there's, if you're not in the in the DOD or you know, uh, nuclear or something like that, you've got to have it for sure there. But even if you don't have official governance someplace, you need to keep good records. And the records may be you have an email that says, Hey, we met and we talked about this, and let me know if you have any questions. And there wasn't they don't have any way of proving that they sent anything with questions so you got the that covered you cover yourself you cover your team you cover your project on every single aspect of your of information that's sent one way or the other uh, and let me go into one more thing whenever you have documents that get updated you need to have version control on those identify the version i always like to put the words latest version at the end, because that way you don't have to go, I have version nine, is this the latest version? You don't have to worry. You have the latest version, you have version nine, and you keep all of your versions and you date them so that they have the date and version. That way you have a um, record of what y'all talked about when, why you changed it, and what the current version is. So that if somebody says, oh, you know, we took that off, we should put it back on, but I don't remember what it was exactly, you can go back and you have it. Keep it in a common drive that that you and your trusted people can access and keep everything in order. Also, I always whenever I have meeting notes, I always put the year hyphen month hyphen day and then the name of the meeting. That way they organize themselves. You don't have to do it for them. Uh, OneNote is a great tool to use to share all this information with your team. You can do a group OneNote. OneNote is awesome because you can do a a search at the top and it searches everything in the OneNote, every page, every everything. So I encourage you to look at OneNote. Okay, any last questions or comments about Bob's topic? Okay, let's go into KPIs. Let me share my screen. Okay, metrics and key performance indicators. I'm gonna go through this real quick. This is straight out of the bad box. I want y'all to see how easy this is to just go through what they have, and then I'll add some things at the end. So you're going to hear people call, talk about KPIs. That is key performance indicators. It's a way to measure performance. So uh, performance of solutions, solution components, and other matters of interest to stakeholders. Super, super vague statement that I wrote. Uh, but the reason it's so vague is because it has to cover every industry and it has to be understandable by everyone around the world because we've got international audience. Okay, I'm just going to read some of this and then I'll explain it. Metric is a quantifiable level of an indicator that an organization uses to measure progress. An indicator identifies a specific numerical measurement that represents a degree of progress toward achieving a goal, ob objective, output, activity, or further input. A key performance indicator, KPI, is one that measures progress toward a strategic goal or objective. Reporting is a process of informing stakeholders of metrics or indicators in a specified format at specified intervals. So think about who needs KPIs. The worker that, is, that knows that they have to put out 50 widgets a day, they need to know what their KPIs are. They also need to know if you're going to be changing the KPIs on them. 
so they understand what their performance needs to be. The manager of that group needs to know of all the people that we have scheduled, we need to end up with 3,000 widgets at the end of the day. Um, so they that dictates their, their uh, staffing, that dictates their performance objectives, that dictates how they manage situations like somebody got hurt, somebody got sick, uh, and can we afford overtime? Because do we need to meet that more than we need to not pay overtime? And then those go roll up into your executive summaries. You know, did this group meet their KPIs? Very often with KPIs and metrics, you're going to see what we call a dashboard. The dashboard is going to have something for an executive that's basically, they call it RAG status, red, amber, or green. Uh, amber being orangey yellow, kind of school bus yellow which they can look at it very quickly and see, is everything on there green? And if it's not, what do we need to do to improve it or address that situation? In healthy organizations, amber and red are just a way to say, I need help and you get help. In unhealthy organizations, you get penalized for things like that. So people are reluctant to raise their hand and say, it's getting to be a problem, I need help. So look for healthy organizations to work on. Okay, so I'll talk through monitoring and evaluation. Okay, meeting objectives, we kind of covered that. So the indicators, a KPI or a metric needs to have these six characteristics. They need to be clear, which means everybody understands it. Nobody is, is fuzzy about what it means. They need to be relevant to the specific task that needs to be done. Um, Cal, breeders want to have 10% uh, of their herd produce calves by the end of the year. Uh, it's specific to breeding cows. Uh, if you're growing grain, you wanna have a certain amount of results on the grain. If you're building houses, you want to build a certain number of houses or a certain square foot of houses by the end of the year. Um, next one, economical, available at a reasonable cost. If you have metrics or key performance indicators that aren't reasonable, you're going to hurt the other side, which is your financial side. You've got to have something that people can actually do with the effort and the manpower and the cost that they are given. Adequate provides sufficient basis on which to assess performance. I talked about 50 widgets. If my, if my widget is uh, processing insurance claims, I have to process 50 insurance claims every day. So that is something that you can, you can determine easily, did I do it or did I not? And quantifiable it can be in, independently validated. I can see what my performance is, but there are other people that can easily monitor my performance. Uh, trustworthy, incredible, based on evidence and research. So your, your performance needs to be based on something that, that makes sense for your organization as well as is obvious. Any questions so far? Okay. In addition, stakeholder interest is also important. If the stakeholders are not focused and interested in these KPIs, maybe the KPI doesn't really matter. For instance, if I say, uh, we want everyone in this department to be able to produce a 50 insurance claims cleared by the end of the uh, each day. If my stakeholders are only interested in the total amount of money that I provide, the number of claims isn't as important because your claims could be $5 claims or $5,000 claims. You need to change your KPIs, make it something that is more applicable to what your stakeholders are interested in. Um, let me see, some of this is really super boring because I wrote it. Um, whenever you establish an indicator, you need to consider the source method of collection, who the collector is, the cost, frequency, and difficulty of collection. If you have something like JIRA, which is a software development ticketing system, you can say in JIRA, we, are, we will close 10 tickets per sprint, and of those tickets, they will be at least 20 points of work. Uh, you've got something in JIRA that's going to track all that for you. You don't have to worry about it. It's, it's independent. Nobody, is, can, nobody can lie about their performance, and it's obvious to everybody. 
Okay, so metrics are quantifiable levels of indicators that are measured at a spe specified point in time. So let's say that at the beginning of February, we are at this number, at March, we're at this number. For instance, we're talking about unique visitors to our website. Uh, we want to know how many unique visitors attend, uh, actually click onto our website. That is a way to measure, are we bringing enough people in? And then we want to know how many people actually complete a survey in our website. So that's a whole different metric, but it's something that we're, we want to know how it is in January, how it is in February, how it is in March. And that tells us if we're growing, if we're dropping, if, you know, what, what the trends are. That is going to be the metric that you're going to be looking at. Um, you can have metrics that you can say between 30% and 70% we're in good, over 70% we're getting into problems because we don't have capacity to handle that. So you've got different things that you're going to be looking at. Uh, let's talk about structure. I talked about JIRA a little bit earlier. Uh, establishing a monitoring evaluation system require data collection procedures. Things like JIRA take care of all of it for you. If you don't have something like JIRA, say you're manufacturing, you may have it, uh, we have we set it up where there's 60 units per pallet and we wanna get out six pallets. So your structure is how many pallets did we get out? That's, that's going to be your, evaluation for your total KPIs. It's going to be your evaluation for how many pallets do we get out in the month of January, February, March. There's your metrics. And then you've got your structure on how you're going to gather that information. So you can do it electronically if that's possible. If you can't, you're going to have to figure out some manual method. Um, baseline data is used to learn about recent performance because let's say we've been working together for three months. The team knows itself. Uh, they've learned each other, they've, they've learned their role. Our baseline is what where performance is between the third and fourth month. That's where we are. We want to only improve from there. Anything before three months, you're still learning and you have to expect that your performance is going to be less than baseline. At some point, you determine baseline and then say, we never want to get below baseline. We want to only improve or at least maintain. Um, three key factors in assessing quality of indicators and their metrics, reliability, validity, and timeliness. If you don't have each of those, you're going to need to reevaluate how you're, you're keeping and evaluating your performance. And then reporting. Uh, I talked earlier about a dashboard for executives. That may start out as a, a clipboard in the manufacturing warehouse that people manually click off, you know, how many things were produced by each person or by this department or by this team. It, then it would go into something else that would be transcribed into an electronic form. Usage considerations, establishing a monitoring and evaluation system that allows stakeholders to understand the extent at which the solution meets an objective as well as how effective the inputs and activities of developing the solution or outputs were. So that's, I think that's pretty easy to understand. Um, if I want to fill a semi every day with what's being manufactured in my warehouse, I, that may be, um, that may be the, my total measurement. But then if I come up and I say, we're not filling the semi, we have to back up and say, why aren't we filling the semi? Uh, indicators, metrics, and reporting also facilitates organizational alignment, linking the goals to the objectives, supporting solutions, and underlying tasks and resources. So if my, my objective is to provide bandages for, for um, some country, and that's the goal of the, of the, um, the goal for the entire organization, we have to go backwards and say, okay, how are we going to do this? Who's going to do it? Do we have enough staff to do it? Do we have the processes in place to do it? Then limitations, gathering excessive amounts of data beyond what's needed will result in unnecessary expense in collecting, analyzing, and reporting. It will also distant, I'm sorry, distract project members from other responsibilities. On Azure projects, this will be particularly evident 
I know of an organization that they had literally one day a week set aside to create decks to show management. So for, for one day a week out of every five, they were not able to be productive. They were doing nothing but putting together PowerPoint decks for their management. So their management could get the information. Uh, somebody came in and looked at what they were doing and they said, this is ridiculous. We could have you fill out a, a form and have that all feed in instead of each person doing their own PowerPoint. Uh, a bureaucratic metric system fails from collecting too much data and not generating useful reports will, that will only allow timely action. Again, that organization, they had to have, they had specific templates in this PowerPoint. Many of them were skipped by the executives because they were useless, but they continued to still have to create them. That doesn't make any sense. If they don't provide value, don't do it. And Agile, that's what we do. If it doesn't provide value, we don't do it, or at least we challenge doing it. Um, People that are charged with collecting metric data must be given feedback to understand how their actions are affecting the quality of the project results. The folks that were developing those decks were never told if there was any results from the executives. They were just like, yeah, we got it. We got it. They were never told, you know what, we'd like for you to focus more on this area and less on this area. You know, put, put, three hours more in this other area so we can increase this, but you got to have the feedback. If the metrics don't provide feedback from the people looking at them, you need to challenge providing the metrics. And when metrics are used to assess performance, individuals being measured are likely to act to increase their performance on those metrics, even if it causes suboptimal performance on other activities. Let me tell you a story. If you've heard of the Bank Wells Fargo, they had a really cool promotion for their people. They gave them really great benefits if they were able to open new loans. The benefits were so good and so far exceeded what the other uh, potential benefits were. People started fraudulently opening loans for friends, family, strangers, fantasy people. Wells Fargo got into a lot of trouble that they actually found out it was because they had the KPI set so that that's how they measured performance. If you didn't open enough loans, you could lose your job. So that was a problem that, that um, was caused directly from KPIs. Okay, I told you earlier, whenever I wrote that, I made it pur purposely very, very vague. I want you to see this website. This is, what is an operations KPI? Different industries have different KPIs, and it's up to you to learn the KPIs that are native to the industry you're walking into, because the people speak this language, they understand it, and there's probably a reason, even if you don't understand it initially, that they have the KPIs. So let's jump down here. Here's finance KPIs for the operations manager. Here's a whole list of KPIs. I'm not going to read all these to you but it tells the people in finance things that they need to understand regarding the health and operability of their organization. Let me page down. Here's staffing operational me metrics, absenteeism rate, overtime hours, utilization rate, employee satisfaction, which incidentally is very hard to measure, employee turnover rate, which is not very hard to measure, and response to open positions. If you have high turnover, you know you've got a problem. It could be a management problem, it could be something else, but that is a really great way to be able to measure if your organization is healthy. Here is manufacturing performance indicators, uh, throughput, first pass yield, demand forecasting, words that you don't normally hear, but they're very, very important in manufacturing. So I encourage you to find the, the uh, metrics and key performance indicators the language of the industry that you're walking into. If you find something that you've learned from a past industry and you can bring into this industry, make the proposal. Sometimes it's exactly what they need, but learning what they speak and learning why they have what they have is very, very critical to, the, to your performance within the organization as well as for you helping the performance within the organization. Does anyone have any questions or comments or stories of how they use metrics or KPIs? 
I'll just point out that um, metrics and KPIs come in many forms. Um, sometimes you just measure something and just try to improve it, make it uh, more is better or less is better. Sometimes you have a target, I want to reach this goal. And at other times, um, it'll be a percentage. Uh, for example, land border crossings are designed with the idea that um, they will um, allow or facilitate, um, say, a, no more than a 20 minute wait 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. So these things come into um, play in a lot of weird situations. Um, and they don't say, okay, you're always going to get through in 20 minutes and no matter what. Well, you have these uh, holidays in Mexico and everybody and their brother tried to cross the border and we're only talking about legal stuff here. Totally valid. And um, if you built a port big enough to handle all those um, crossers on uh, those particular time periods briefly in the year, it had a ton of expensive infrastructure sitting around unused most of the year, and that's not efficient. So all the metrics and KPIs come from a place that makes sense for a reason, and ideally, you will learn everything that goes into them. That's true. Good point, Bob. Oh, there's two things I, I failed to mention. Whenever you are talking KPIs, very often you can link that to a contract. Uh, there's a, a statement of work that's somewhere in your organization that says we will provide something. Whenever you provide this, you're going to have to say 80% of the time we will have a, a response time of five minutes or less. And you, you need to have that in there because uh, recently teams went down nationwide uh, a lot of people had trouble and there were people that they couldn't approve timesheets. They couldn't communicate with their, their coworkers. They couldn't do a whole lot of things because Teams was down. And I asked my sister who was impacted by this and, and I said, there's got to be an exception in your contract for things like technical difficulties. And she said, I don't know. I said, okay, first thing you do is you report every technical difficulty to the help desk so you have it documented. And then whenever people start squawking that you didn't meet your agreements, you can say, here is our ex explanation. But KPIs and um, there's, another, there's another acronym other than statement of work that talks about- Service, service, service level agreement? Yes, SLA? yes, SLAs, service level agreement. Thank you. Uh, it, I read your mind. Say it again. I said I'll just read your mind. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Your SLA will say, you know, 50% of the time we will meet this level of service. And, you know, there's going to be exceptions. And the people that keep you to that contract are going to want charts, graphs, something that demonstrates, did you meet your SLAs or your, your um, SOWs? Okay. I said I had two things and I forgot the other one because I got so excited about service level agreements. Um, one thing that, I'm sorry, did anybody have any, any comments or questions about metrics or key performance indicators? Well, one thing I could say about the data part that you were talking about collecting, mm -hmm. we are seeing a lot of businesses get in trouble or do things incorrectly because some of the new government standards, especially Europe um, and a lot of the places around the U.S. are starting to adopt the European standards. So, yeah. you know, it used to be a free-for-all. Collect as much data as you can on everybody and everything. And, and now not only can you, are you not supposed to do that, but with one 
request, a person is supposed to re be able to remove themselves from anything you've collected. So you have to have a process in place for that, um, which, yeah, it's caused a lot of headaches for a lot of businesses. And so you get KPIs of we will we will have our databases 90% clear and and information masked by this certain date and then you know continue monitoring and yeah you've got measurements and that's what KPIs and metrics are all about. Yes, Bob. You told another story about wasted effort. I remember reading in the early 90s. Uh, that somebody estimated that uh, in response to people wondering why the advent of computers up until that time hadn't really made businesses measurably more efficient yet. And somebody um, surmised that um, every single benefit that had been realized by computers up until that point had been canceled by the government requesting ridiculous reports and data collections and stats merely because it was possible to actually do them. So I have a serious hard time with um, nonsense like that. So always try to be adding value and not wasting everyone's time. Um, that's why they have things like test-driven development and requirement traceability matrices. So you aren't doing stuff that's not needed. And uh, if you really need to get in the right frame of mind, uh, go watch the movie Office Space like six times back to back. Um, and then you'll be in a very happy or at least funny place. Gotcha. Which movie was that, sorry? Office, office space. Oh, out of space. Okay. Office space with the red stapler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone asked for the link to that KPI website in the chat. I would like it also. Okay. Let me drop that in there. Bob, I'm a huge fan of Dilbert. I, I, oh yeah. I miss those cartoons. I mean, those were perfect for. I swear they followed me around in the office sometimes when they wrote those. They did. I sent him a suggestion once based on a conversation a bunch of us had at lunch. And uh, Scott Adams wrote me back and said, um, well, I just got back from vacation <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have a million emails and I never saw that DNA strip, but um, I love that strip. That one was great. Okay, we are at the end of our time. If y'all would like to hang on for just a few minutes, uh, we've had a few people ask uh, for tips and tricks on taking the test. So Bob, if you can give us your, um, we they can go back and watch the eighth, one to talk about how to apply for the test and it does have some tips and tricks but there's some things that you probably have thought of since then that you can tell us um i will do the best i can i don't know if uh, my um observations are the most useful for anybody um knowing the material is the main thing I had a uh, kind of a loose conception of what I've developed since as uh, my framework that makes my thoughts way more organized now. But I had a uh, kind of an current understanding of it from years and years and years and freaking years of um, doing this stuff. And, uh, I would say the main thing is 
look at the diagrams in the Babon um, and see how things flow um, from one to the other. There are these flow diagrams in the signology areas. And um, knowing those will really help. We've spent a lot of time on these uh, methods or bat box techniques. Those are really of lesser importance. Uh, when we're done with these, we'll go back and hammer on the knowledge areas more and again. And hopefully those of you that have been around for a while will be able to integrate in um, reading the bat box does not hurt, but mostly it's just a pile of information that may fry your um, noggin. So if you have an overall approach um, and an overall understanding of what's going on, and you can think through every problem individually, That'll be your biggest asset. There are a couple of little tricks you can use for answering individual questions. Like if you have four options and um, all the choices have like five items in it, but three of them are the same in every question, that's kind of fogging up things. And if you can eliminate any extraneous information and or um, eliminate um, any options or potential answers and increase your chances of getting individual questions right, those are always good. So basically just having an overall feel for what you're doing, um, make sure you answer every question on the test. I um, did not have the opportunity to go back and revisit questions. Um, I took notes um, on my answers. Um, as I took the exam with the idea that I mark anything I wasn't sure of and go back. And by the time I mm -hmm. got to the end, I was yeah, so hung good. out I, and all the time was gone. Um, it was all I could do to get through. And I've done this for a the while, what? so. Um, I don't know. Oh, okay. I studied super hard. Oh, just move it to the other wall if you want for now. Hold on, Cliff. Um, that's about it. Okay. Uh, so, so what I take away is if you don't answer it, it's going to be wrong. If you guess, you might get it right. Uh, whenever we were going through all of the the earlier uh, meetings that we actually went through the sample test questions, Bob led us through, identify the one that you think is absolutely ludicrous. It doesn't even belong in the, the answer set. We kicked that one out. So we ended up with three to work it with instead of four, which increased our possibilities considerably of getting it right. And then the next thing is, if you read the Babok over and over and over, you're going to hear that voice in your mind. And whenever you read that on the test answer, you will say, that's out of the bad box. Uh, the key is, is you don't, you don't litter your knowledge with something else. You read direct, directly out of the bad box in the order that it's given to you. You understand, you know, when would I use this technique? What is the role of each of the people? You know, who does what in the project according to the Babok? Let me, let me stress this. What the Babok says is not always what we live in reality. It's what the Babok says. To pass the test, you've got to know what the Babok says. That's it. Okay. Just so you know, um, just before I took the test, I took a really good organized paid 
training was over the previous like seven weekends. And one of the things we got was this book um, by the guy who ran the um, training program. And this book is basically a distillation of what's in the Baba and has some of the diagrams or similar diagrams. So if you know the inputs and outputs to all the knowledge errors and the activities within the knowledge errors, you're going to be way ahead because that gives you the bat box kind of thinking about the flow. Now, um, as Thea points out, the bat box tries very hard not to be prescriptive. So they give you all the techniques and leave it uh, kind of up to you to stitch them together into an engagement or um, narrative that goes across a, uh, an entire engagement. Um, the framework that I have kind of takes the exact same thoughts and puts them in a more um, approachable, understandable, clear um, context that helps you know where you are. And I think that might be helpful. Um, they're really the same information. I have a grid in many of my uh, full-scale um, presentations that talks about my framework forces, how the Babon um, does their signal jerrys, and uh, they match pretty closely. Okay. We are over time and I typically don't do this, but I, I committed to somebody that we would we would have this discussion. I wanna say one more thing about certification. Certification is only valuable under two conditions. If the, if the employer that you're working for or going to work for values it, or if you want it for yourself. Certification does not mean that you're a better BA. Certification is not a limitation to you getting a BA position. You can be a very good BA without certification, but if this is your goal, we will help you get there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation and focus and attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you're free to contact me on LinkedIn. I keep it on LinkedIn because I get too many recruiters on my, on my email. So um, contact me if you have any questions and I'll see y'all next week. Bye guys. Yep. See you next week. Bye. See you next week. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.